with me today is uh, David Bronachowski, Chief Financial Officer of Algonquin uh, Power and Utilities Corp. And uh, just by way of introduction, your, your company is kind of interesting. It's based in Canada, but the vast majority of its uh, assets are in the U.S. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, why that is and, and, and how it works for Algonquin? Sure. The company got its start uh, some 30 years ago, building small renewable power plants uh, up in, in Canada. And uh, the company went uh, went public in uh, in '97, and then continued to uh, to diversify into other forms of generation, wind and solar, and then uh, ultimately started buying uh, some regulated utilities uh, in the states as part of a diversification uh, strategy. And then uh, ultimately, I mean, you fast forward to today, we've now grown that utility platform to be basically two thirds of our business with uh, with another. Uh, one third being in the power space, and so most of that growth has actually been here in the United States. So, so I, I feel very comfortable being in New York at a Canadian fixed income conference <laughs> because I kind of feel that's uh, it's kind of uh, true to what we are. That basically, you know, a U.S. company inside a, a Canadian entity. And, and so you're up to about 90% of your assets in the U.S. right now, is that that's, right? That's correct. And is that sort of the balance we can expect going forward? Well, pretty much because, you know, most of the growth that we're experiencing right now and that we see over the next five years it is going to be uh, in the United States. We've, uh, we've started to do a little bit of investment internationally, but that's likely not going to amount to more than 10 to 15% of our, our business overall. So, so yes, most of that is going to be in the U.S. because I think the thing you can observe in the Canadian marketplace is, you know, other than, uh, I think, Alberta, uh, pretty much every province is full up on renewable energy. And, and so there's not a lot of further growth that needs to take place in Canada to, uh, to bring renewables to the market. But there's huge opportunities to do that here in the United States. Right. And, and you finance your business sort of in a unique way for a, a power and utilities company. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what you do differently? Yeah, so, uh, so we have two uh, senior unsecured bond platforms. Um, we've got uh, one that we've executed entirely in the US private placement market that finances our, our utility uh, business. We're, you know, arguably, uh, you know, probably one of the top ten issuers into the U.S. private placement market there, uh, with you know about two and a half billion dollars uh, outstanding uh, in in that market. Uh, we, then we have a senior unsecured bond platform that we have on the power side of our business, and that uh, is used to finance all of our uh, renewables business. And the the interesting thing that I do like to point out to uh, to people is. It's getting harder and harder for companies to get those long-term 20, 25-year uh, power purchase agreements with uh, regulated utilities or investment-grade counterparties. And so what that really means is it's going to get harder and harder for renewables companies to actually obtain project-level non-recourse financing because you've got a 20 or 25-year asset and who are you going to go to uh, to finance that on the debt side if you don't have that long-term offtake arrangement. The nice thing about our portfolio, we have a senior unsecure bond platform that's supported by 40 generating facilities in the renewable space. So for us to, to go out, manage our own offtake, and we, do, we, we don't play in the merchant market, and so we look to kind of get 10 to 15 years of revenue certainty out of it, and then we can plug that in uh, to be you know, the 41st generating station out of that basket. And so you can think of the power of the diversification that comes with, uh, with, with, with that. Right. And so your company, uh, like Dave mentioned, you're really big in renewable energy. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the, the economics of that? Um, is that, uh, is that that's a purely economic decision based on um, the, the cost of those projects and the, the, the power and the, the revenue that comes back from them? Sure, I can give you a couple of great examples because today, Wind generation is now the cheapest form of new generation, bar none, that's out there today. And so we can build, now in the United States, it's heavily subsidized, so it's sort of, it's on sale, it's like hyper competitive. With the PTCs that are out here in the United States, we can build a wind plant for two and a half cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, but even without the PTCs, we can build a, a new wind generating station in a decent wind environment for about four, four and a half cents a, a kilowatt hour. And you are not building any other new form of generation 
uh, for that price. And in fact, it's so competitive that uh, at our Missouri utility uh, that we bought in 2017, there's a coal generating facility, a 250 megawatt coal generating facility. Well, we got approval from the regulator in Missouri to shut down that coal plant and build out 600 megawatts of new wind to replace it. That represents a billion dollars of investment that's going right into the rate base of, of that utility. So that, that, that just goes to show, show you that the all-in cost of wind is actually cheaper than the variable cost of coal. So that sort of greening of the fleet that you just uh, you just described, shutting down coal plants, building more more wind, uh, how, can we expect that to continue? Is there anything that would change that trajectory for you? Well, certainly we've got this to, to finish up in Missouri, but we also have on the books yet another plan, and this has to do uh, with our California uh, electric utility. We're, we're fortunate enough to actually be the electric utility that's on the the west side of Lake Tahoe. So it's beautiful. They get 400 feet of snow per year. So if you want to go skiing, it's great there. But, uh, but they're also very environmentally conscious in, in that area. And so as a result of that, we're, uh, we're looking to convert that entire utility and it'll end up being one of the first uh, utilities in the state of California to go 100% renewable. And we're looking to do that uh, within the next five years. Okay. And, and tell us a little bit about how you're financing these projects. I understand you recently tapped the uh, the green bond market. Yeah, so uh, a, as I mentioned before, we do have our bond platform that we use to finance the, the, the renewables. But uh, earlier this year, you know, we uh, we actually did um, uh, qualify the bond as a, as a green bond. And, uh, you know, I, li I like to say, like, we were... We were green before we even knew it was hip to be green, if you know what I mean, because we've been doing this kind of all of our all of our life. And so, um, you know, the, the the folks at National Bank uh, highly recommended that uh, you know, since we're doing it anyways, then we 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 might as well get it qualified to be green. So we went through the process, qualified it as a as a green bond, uh, and, and I will say that it 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 helped with demand, but it didn't necessarily help with the coupon too much because okay. I guess you know the people that like green also like green <laughs> and so but I but, but I think over time I, I think w what we're going to see is is increasing pools of capital that are going to be allocated to this so so I, I do think in the longer term that it actually will make a difference in pricing all right and so you, you, you think, I mean, based on that, that process for you, do you see a lot more of that, uh, those green bonds in the future for Algonquin? Sure. Like uh, n next year, we're probably going to be coming to market with, uh, with two bonds because there's a huge investment that's taking place right now, as I said, to uh, take advantage of these production tax credits in the United States. So we will have uh, a bond um, that we're going to issue on the utility side that will qualify uh, as green because... That's being used now to shut down the coal plant. And then on the uh, power side of the business, it's all wind and solar. And so it'll certainly qualify. So we will have two bonds coming to market next year that both will qualify as green. All right. And uh, so I know this is a bond conference, but uh, I have to mention that your equity has done great over the past uh, couple of years. And uh, saw that the company just last week issued, uh, announced a 23 million share of sale. Um, how do you see as sort of the your target capital structure as far as issuing debt versus uh, equity going forward? Yeah, well, I've always said that really what makes a, a a really strong bond platform is to have a really strong equity platform, and so for us, it's all about maintaining our credit metrics. And so we target a triple B flat uh, investment grade credit metric. We have that, you know, in all uh, parts of our uh, of our business. Uh, we're rated by S&P, Fitch, and DBRS uh, uh, up in Canada. And so it's very important for us to maintain that credit rating. We've never hesitated to come to the market to uh, raise equity to make sure that we're not getting too far ahead of our skis from a leverage point of view. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's really been powerful uh, for us when we do come to the, to, to the bond market because I, I think we, we enjoy today, I think, a very, very good audience uh, in the, the debt markets up in Canada and in the United States. Right. And uh, aside from developing the, the projects in-house, uh, another uh, part of Algonquin's strategy has been these tuck-in acquisitions. 
what can we, we expect uh, as far as how big those acquisitions are going to be? What geographic areas? What what industries? Sure. Uh, well, just uh, I, I will put a, a little bit of a qualifier in there because on the renewable power side of our business, we would never do acquisitions. Uh, we believe the value creation, certainly in today's market, where you've got all these pools of capital chasing renewable projects, operating renewable projects, that uh, that's just a, a cost of capital play. And it, for us, it's, it's not a value maximizing strategy. So we, we prefer to find greenfield or early stage projects, develop them and bring them to market and then you know, harvest that over the next 20 years. So any acquisitions will take place uh, on, the, uh, on the utility side of the business. And yes, it has been uh, an important uh, strategy for us because uh, you, know, you, you, don't, uh, you don't build a new town anymore, or at least not very often. <laughs> and so uh, the only way to expand your footprint in the utility space is to, is to buy new acquisitions. But at our existing size, and you know, we're, we're, we've been arguably the most active uh, acquirer in the regulated utility space, I think, bar none over the last 10 years. So we see every deal that comes to market, but we're very disciplined uh, in that approach. And uh, I, can, I can share quite, uh, quite frankly with everybody, we lose more deals than we actually win. And, and we're okay with that. You know, we, we draw our line in the sand from a valuation perspective and, uh, and, and leave it there. But I think at our existing size, you know, I think what's happened is our opportunity set has only grown. So I think we're at the size now where it's pretty sweet, where, you know, we can buy a $300 million uh, utility like New Brunswick Gas, which we just closed uh, on October 1st, and it actually can be meaningful for us. But we're also at the size now, like we could, we could do a $5 billion acquisition and make that happen. So, so I think our, our opportunity set has never been bigger. Well, and I, I have to finish with the question we've been asking all of our panelists today. Uh, what do you think are the chances of a recession in the next 12 months? Well, that's, uh, that's an interesting question. And, and really, I guess it, it, uh, it really hinges on you know, the question really being, what do you think of a recession occurring in the United States? Because I think Canada is very much uh, intertwined with the U.S. on that, on that front. Um, and I think my view is it's, it's probably relatively low. The, um, the bond market, you know, is moving into, in some ways, you could call it uncharted territory, uh, which we've never seen before. Certainly you're seeing it in Europe now uh, with negative interest rates. You're seeing movements by the Fed here in the United States where they've signaled that they're prepared to bulk up their, their balance sheet. So I think there's going to be enough monetary stimulus uh, in the system over the next 12 months to kind of hold off a, a recession. I think if, uh, if Trump seals a deal with trade uh, with China, I think that'll be uh, very strong and bullish for the, for the markets. And, and you've got to think he's very motivated to do that. So, so I think the, the odds of a recession over the next 12 months are, are relatively small. All right. Well, we will leave it there. Thank you very much.